You can join me in opening your Bibles to the book of James. We're in James chapter 2, and if you don't have a Bible, please grab one from a seat nearby. Um, And James 2 is on page 1012 in those Bibles. Uh, Before we read this, a couple uh, just notes. So I was not here last Sunday. I was preaching at Redeeming Grace Church in Lafayette, and I was so grateful to be there. And Danny Strong, the senior pastor of that church, was here preaching. So if you weren't here this past Sunday, um, I encourage you to listen to Danny's sermon. Um, It was on Psalm 32, and he said, repentance is paradise. It was an excellent uh, sermon, so you can find that on our website or our YouTube uh, channel. And second, it is June, and so that means a uh, quick note here about what many people call Pride Month. Um, just want to remind us of something, one thing really that gets forgotten uh, this month often, but we as Christians need to remember, um, and that is that you can love someone and also disagree with them. And so, it's a false choice to say that you either affirm every decision someone makes or you hate them. Jesus modeled truth and love. He loved people deeply, and He constantly disapproved of all sorts of the ways that people thought and behaved. So, we embrace, from His example and His command, both truth and love. We embrace the biblical and biological truth about gender and sexuality and we keep loving. So, we love and we disagree, and language uh, that creates a false choice there uh, is sometimes used to manipulate uh, people to feeling bad enough to change what they actually do believe, and so we don't want to do that. So, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Let's read this together. What good is it, my brothers, If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Well, show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you that by your spirit you have breathed it out, and it's true through and through. So we pray that you'd give us wisdom and insight to hear this rightly, and then not just be hearers but doers of your word pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're seeing as we go through the book of James, paragraph by paragraph, that this is an incredibly practical book. But James, as he addresses practical problems, and we'll see these week after week in this letter, he identifies also a theological problem underneath the practical problems. The problem under the problems is this. Many people profess faith in Christ, but they are not truly saved. Many people who think they are Christians actually are not true Christians. Just yesterday, someone told me about a person who has all sorts of issues, rage, lying, disrespect, seemingly out of control in life. And I said, this person needs God to give him a new heart. And the response was, 
Well, he says he believes in God. Or maybe you have a coworker who claims to be a Christian. He has a Bible that he reads. He has a church that he's involved with. He loves spiritual conversations with you. And he also has a problem, or sorry, he has no problem sleeping around. He says he knows what the Bible clearly says about this, but he also expects that God will forgive him. No one's perfect, right? He says. So are these people really saved? Here are the questions we're thinking about this morning. Is someone saved who believes the truth about Jesus, but nothing changes in their life from it? Is someone saved if they go to church, read the Bible, like spiritual conversations, lead a decent life, but they don't have any real costly obedience or self-denial for Jesus' sake in their life? Is someone saved if they trust Jesus as Savior, but do not follow Him as Lord? Is someone saved if they have faith in Jesus, but they don't produce any works of love? James wrote this section to answer these questions. And they're not just theological or theoretical questions. This is also a personal question. Could you have a faith in Jesus that doesn't actually save you? Do you know how you could tell if that's true of you or not? The main point of this text in James is this. A faith without works is not a faith that saves. Faith without works is useless, dead, and doesn't save. Some of you may have a hard time believing that. There are a number of reasons for this. It could be your compassion for others that always wants to assume and hope the best, which is a good thing, but it could lead you to a wrong conclusion about people. It could be the influence of theological movements in the past century um, that have really spread widely among especially American evangelicalism. But the result is that this, what James speaks about here, is not a common belief in the church anymore. So here's the plan. I want to show you that there are two kinds of faith, and only one of them saves. I want to show you that this is what James is saying. Then we'll see what dead faith looks like compared to living faith. And then we'll consider why this distinction matters so much for us today. So first, there are two kinds of faith, and only one of them saves. So here's the main point. Faith without works is useless, dead and doesn't save. James makes this point at the very beginning in verse 14. You can see it with me. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So this is someone who believes in Jesus, but nothing changes in their life. He's not talking here about true saving faith, but a different kind of faith. Notice how he puts it in verse 14. He says, if someone says, claims he has faith. So this person says he has faith. He claims to have faith. But then at the end of the verse, James says, can that faith save him? He's asking a rhetorical question. What good is it if someone has faith but no works? Can this faith save him? It's a rhetorical question. And the answer is that it doesn't save the person who has it. He repeats the point in different ways. Notice verse 17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 20, faith apart from works is useless. Verse 26, faith apart from works is dead. He's not just saying you have living faith, but your works are dead. He says if you have faith but not works, your faith is actually dead. It's a dead faith. It's a useless faith. It doesn't save James is saying that if you don't have works, it shows something is wrong, not with just your obedience, but with your believing. If you have a true, living, saving faith, then you will also produce good works. Is that not what he's saying very clearly here? Think of faith like a seed. One author put it this way. Faith is like a seed. If a living seed is planted, it will produce a living plant. If a dead seed is planted, 
It produces nothing. James is concerned about people who say they have a living faith inside them, but is a dead faith. And this is eternally important because every single person will stand before their maker one day and will either stand before him with true, living, saving faith or will be self-deceived with a dead, useless, non-saving faith. So here's why this matters for us, because some of you may need to lose your assurance of salvation so that you can gain the real thing. Here's how Sam Albury put it. Here's the genuinely frightening truth that should give you and me pause. It is possible to claim and to believe you possess genuine saving faith when in fact you do not. It is possible, in other words, to believe you have things sorted with God, that you will not face His judgment, that there's hope for you beyond the grave, and yet remain under the judgment of God. It is possible, in short, unknowingly, to possess counterfeit faith. So this may be unsettling, but this kind of text and this kind of message is a gift. How terrible would it be if God didn't give us a text like this to wake us up? This moment when you feel uncomfortable may be the most important moment of your entire life. Because you will finally in this moment this morning wake up to the reality that you thought you were a Christian and you want to be a Christian, but you thought you were just by being here at Zionsville Fellowship and by liking the Bible, by reading the books I recommend at the Resource Center, by enjoying spiritual conversations, by being in a small group. And yet you are waking up then this morning by God's grace to realize you need to actually come to Jesus. You realize that you've been treating Jesus like a get-out-of-hell-free card. And you need to come to him as your personal, living, true Savior and leader of your life, rescuer from sin, and friend. Now, some of you are true Christians, and you have a very sensitive conscience. And so you're starting maybe right now to unnecessarily doubt your salvation. I get that. Um, and I don't want you to feel that way. So th there's just multiple kinds of people in the room. We need to hear multiple kinds of things. So may the Lord, by the Spirit, help you in your heart hear what you need to hear this morning. So that's also why the next points matter. How can we tell the difference? How can we tell if we or someone else has a living faith or a dead faith? So that's the second point. It's this. Here's what dead faith looks like. James gives us three descriptions of it. In verses 15 to 19, dead faith doesn't do anything, doesn't think it needs to do anything, and it thinks thinking is enough. So first, it doesn't do anything. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So this is the person who's happy to send thoughts and prayers and could make a difference in the person's life, but doesn't. True faith, though, actively seeks to help others in their needs because it's sincere. It sees needs and it responds with real help. And if your faith doesn't do that, it's not a real Christian faith. In other words, the evidence that your faith is real is that you help other Christians in need, according to James here. James probably learned this from Jesus. Have you heard Jesus' story about what the last judgment will be like? It's Matthew 25. You can read it sometime later. Jesus says that he'll sit on a throne. The Son of Man will sit on a throne. All nations will be gathered before him, and he'll separate people into two categories, whom he calls sheep and goats. He'll put the sheep on the right, the goats on the left. The sheep will enter into the eternal kingdom, the goats will receive eternal punishment. 
And what's most surprising about Jesus' story is the criteria he uses to distinguish the two groups. It's whether or not they cared for other Christians. Jesus' brothers, he says, your brothers and sisters, other Christians in need. He'll say to the goats, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So dead faith doesn't do anything. It doesn't change the person who has it. Second, dead faith doesn't think it needs to do anything. This is verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. James responds, show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. So someone is saying, listen, some Christians have faith, Some Christians have works, right? You have faith, I have works, or you have works, I have faith. There's just different things for different people. So why do you need to make the faith alone people feel bad if they don't have works? Everyone's got their own gifts. God gives some people faith, some people works. James responds, well, show me your faith apart from your works. Can't do it. And he says, I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, you misunderstand how faith and works go together if you think, well, some people have faith, some people have works, and that's just fine. You think they can stand alone, but they can't. If you have true faith, it will produce works. You can't claim to trust Jesus and not works. Or you can claim to trust Jesus, I guess he'd say, as much as you want, but it can't be seen unless you have works that prove it. Third, dead faith thinks thinking is enough. So it defines faith as merely intellectual agreement with truth. So here's James's response in verse 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So this person believes that God is one. That was the foundational confession of faith in the Old Testament. They get an A plus on their theology test. And James says, do you know who else gets an A on their theology test? Demons do. So you aren't saved merely by believing certain things are true. We can think of it like this. There's a difference between believing that and believing in. You can believe that the Bible's true. You can believe that Jesus lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death, rose in victory. You can believe that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. You can believe that the world needs Jesus and so do you. And yet, if this is all your faith is, just believing that, agreeing things are true, that's not a saving faith because it's not believing in Jesus, trusting Him personally. So true faith is not less than agreeing with truth, but it's more than that. Saving faith is a sincere trust in and reliance on Jesus for salvation. It's coming to Christ personally for a personal rescue from the penalty and power of sin. Maybe you have thought that your agreement with the truth was what made you a Christian, and you realize you may not have true saving faith. Or maybe someone you know and love you're thinking about this morning because they don't fit this category. What then does it look like to have true saving faith? What does a living faith look like? Well, that's what we see next. So what living faith looks like? Third, James gives two examples from the Old Testament, examples of Abraham and Rahab. James points to Genesis 22 and the story of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac. We read that earlier this morning. Abraham had already trusted God at this point with a true living faith long before this, but now in this moment, Abraham demonstrated that his faith was real. Abraham's faith was seen in his works. Now, James uses a phrase that trips us up. He says in verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Now, on the surface, that sounds like an obvious contradiction to what the Apostle Paul says. Paul says that we are justified by faith and not by works. James says here we are justified by works. So, many say this is an obvious contradiction. 
I think it's a superficial reading of the text that says they're a contradiction, although obviously on the surface it looks like it, so we have to think it through. James's point is that there is an organic connection, and Paul agrees with this, between faith and works. So he gives three observations to explain what he means when he says Abraham was justified by works. So here's three things we learn about true, saving, living faith here. First, living faith is active along with works. This is verse 22. You see that faith, as he's describing Abraham, you see that faith was active along with his works. So Abraham already had faith in God. James is saying that Abraham's faith was now demonstrated in his works. It was active. Faith was active along with his actions of obedience to God. Second, living faith is completed by works. He says, and faith was completed by his works. So faith is what produced and led to this work. Works are the natural outcome, goal, and completion of faith. So think of it like a tree's roots and a tree's fruit. The roots go down where you can't see them, and they drink in the water, invisible to us above the ground. But the evidence that the tree is putting its roots in and drinking the water is you see above ground the fruit. So invisible roots drinking by faith produce visible fruit. Without the roots, there's no fruit. If you have the roots, you have the fruit. Third, living faith is fulfilled in works. Or as James puts it here, the text that affirmed that Abraham was actually justified by faith is fulfilled in his obedience. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. Now, this gets slightly technical for a moment. So, James is quoting here Genesis 15, verse 6. This is one of the most important texts in the Bible. Paul refers to this text often to refer to and to make his case for justification by faith apart from works. Because in that moment in Abraham's life, in Genesis 15, God made promises to Abraham. He said, Look at the stars. I'll make you, I'll give you a line and a heritage as many as the stars in the heavens. He'd bless him with that many offspring. And Genesis 15, 6 says that Abraham believed God. He trusted God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. So he trusted God and he was declared righteous upon trusting. So Paul rightly looks at that and says, justification by faith apart from works. James quotes that text. He agrees with that text. He agrees with that doctrine. He's literally quoting the classic justification by faith text from Genesis 15, 6. But James has another point he wants to make. He's saying that Abraham's faith, his justifying faith in Genesis 15, is fulfilled in his obedience in Genesis 22, decades later. So God had promised Abraham now that he would, he would give him this lineage and it would come through his son Isaac. Isaac would continue his line. But now in Genesis 22, God is telling Abraham, sacrifice your son. So how, just put yourself in Abraham's situation. How is God going to fulfill his promise to multiply my line through Isaac if Isaac has to die? So Abraham concludes by faith that God must have a plan to raise Isaac from the dead after he sacrificed so that he can fulfill his promise to multiply my offspring through Isaac. And that's how the author of Hebrews puts it. Hebrews 11 says this, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac, shall your offspring be named. And so here's the author of Hebrews' observation. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. So James is saying that Abraham trusted God, and we see that that was a real, active, living trust. And we see that because he was willing to offer his son. 
He makes the same point about Rahab in verse 25, her obedience proved that her faith was real. So, let's return to the question then, how this fits with Paul. Why does James say that Abraham was justified by works? How is this not a flat contradiction with Paul, who says we're not justified by works? Well, the word justified can be used slightly differently depending on context. Paul's using it in the sense of a courtroom declaration. The person is declared righteous in God's courtroom by faith alone. So, Paul says when Abraham believed God, he was justified, and we see that in Genesis 15. But the word can also be used in the sense of giving a demonstration or a vindication of something. So, you can use the word to mean this person was demonstrated or shown to be righteous. So, I think that's how James is using the term. He isn't saying that the works Abraham did are somehow the basis of his eternal salvation. He's quoting the text that said Abraham was righteous already by faith. But his point is that Abraham was then later demonstrated or shown to be righteous by his works. His works gave evidence of his faith. So, we still want to ask the question, why would Paul and James use, use this slightly differently here? It's because they're, using, they're addressing uh, different problems here. Paul was constantly addressing the problem of legalism. So, people said you had to do certain works as the basis for your salvation. And Paul says, no. Don't you see in Genesis 15 that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? He was justified by trusting. So, while Paul addressed the legalists, James is here addressing uh, what we can call antinomian, antinomians, right? Those who are anti-law, anti-works. People said, faith is simply agreeing intellectually with truth. And James says, well, that kind of faith doesn't save you. And so he quotes Genesis 15, 15 to affirm that Abraham was righteous by faith, but then he shows that that faith led to works. Abraham's faith was demonstrated or vindicated by works. So James and Paul are addressing different contexts here, but they both agree theologically with how faith and works relate. They both agree that true saving faith produces works. So dead faith then doesn't do anything doesn't think it needs to do anything, and it thinks thinking is enough. Living faith is active with works, is completed by works, is fulfilled in works. Okay, so fourth, finally here, why does this distinction matter, this distinction between two kinds of faith? Well, it helps us understand four important realities. First, this helps us understand the relationship of faith and works. So here's a few statements that help us understand their relationship. And I think by grasping these kind of simple statements, it will clear up a lot of theological misunderstanding that is really widespread. So here's, I think, three statements. One, we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. I think John Calvin might have put it that way first. It, this is not about adding works to our faith in order to be saved. This is about how true saving faith produces works. Second, saving faith inevitably produces good works. So, faith is the root, works are the fruit. If the tree of your life has roots that go down in real living faith, you will produce fruit. That doesn't mean you're going to have you know, a full, if you're an apple tree, a tree full with apples, you might in seasons have a few, but if you're an apple tree, you're going to make some apples. Third, good works are the necessary evidence of saving faith, not the optional evidence, but the necessary evidence of saving faith. Now, Martin Luther didn't like this text. He actually thought it contradicted Paul, at least for a big part of his life. I think he misunderstood what James actually said, and even his close friend thought he misunderstood this. But he actually did agree with the theology here. Luther was the champion of justification by faith alone, apart from works. But listen to how he beautifully made the same point that James is making. He said this, He who wants to be a true Christian must be truly a believer. But he does not truly believe if works of love do not follow his faith. So he's saying you need true faith and you don't actually truly believe, no matter what you think in your head, you don't truly believe if works of love don't follow your faith. 
So this helps us understand how faith and works relate. Second, this helps us understand how to talk about our own story if you are a real Christian. Have you heard anyone say this before? I trusted Jesus as Savior at one point in my life, but then it wasn't until many years later that I began following Him as Lord. That's really common. But that's not how Christians have historically talked about their salvation, and it misses what the New Testament actually teaches about faith and conversion. Jesus is both Savior and Lord, and you trust Him as both or you've trusted Him as neither. Jesus calls us to both faith and repentance, and you have done both of those or you've done neither of them. It's not true that someone is actually saved with an empty, non-working, non-living faith. When you actually started repenting of sin, personally trusting in Jesus, actively following Him, that's when you know your faith is real. So maybe you viewed your story or you've talked about your story with this framework, and it's not entirely your fault. It's just been so common to think, trust Jesus as Savior, later follow as Lord, that we can sometimes kind of map our own story into that grid. And it's not actually how our story worked. We've just kind of fit it into that framework because we thought that language kind of fit us. But if you viewed your story that way, here's three ways to understand your story that would be theologically true. Option one is that you actually were not converted at that earlier point in time when you thought you were trusting Jesus as Savior, but you were converted, trusting Him truly as Savior and as Lord later. So, for instance, you can view your story like this. You can say, instead of, I trusted Him as Savior and was saved, but then later followed Him as Lord, you can say this. I had an intellectual agreement with the truth of Jesus at a point, but it didn't change my life at all, so it clearly wasn't a living, saving faith. But then later, I truly repented and trusted Jesus personally, and it changed me. So that's one option. Another option is that you were actually converted back then, but you did change a little, and it was immature, but it was real. There was some change. You can think of your story like this. I trusted Jesus a long time ago, and I do believe that it was a living faith because I was changing by the Spirit. However, I do wish the change was faster. I stayed immature for a long time, And then later, I did have this point where there was a surge of greater growth, and I'm thankful for it. It was like a spiritual growth spurt. A third option could be that as you think of your story, you're just not sure. It wasn't clear to you, and it isn't clear to you when you actually started trusting with a living faith. You don't know when God gave you a new heart, but you know now that it happened at some point back then. So you can just think of your story like this. I think I might have been saved a long time ago. I know I was believing the truth about Jesus, and I think it was genuine because there was some evidence, but I'm really not totally sure because that evidence was kind of small. I think I was just doing it to please other people. I don't know what really was going on back then, but I do know this. I am following and trusting Jesus now, and my life is changing. So I don't know exactly when he gave me the new heart, but it's happened, and I'm grateful. Now, each of those are different ways of saying that you were not saved by a mere intellectual faith, that you're saved by a real living faith. You just don't know when it was. So this helps you understand your story better than the unbiblical theological grid that has been promoted a lot this past generation. Third, this helps us understand how our culture views Christians. So when when people think of Christians in general in our culture, they usually are lumping together everyone who professes faith or claims to be a Christian. But James is saying there is a real difference between a dead faith and a living faith. So with that in mind, consider this. Nancy Piercy has recently researched the topic of men and masculinity in marriage. She recently wrote a book called The Toxic War Against Masculinity. And in her studies, she was looking into a lot of statistics and stereotypes about men. And she looked into, you know, across the culture, whether they're Christians or of a different religion or secular, just 
men in general across this culture, uh, who are the most loving to their families? Which men are least likely to divorce their spouse? Which men are most engaged with their kids? She looked into which kinds of men have the least or highest rates of domestic abuse and violence. And here's what she found. There is a giant chasm between two kinds of professing Christians. There are nominal evangelical men who say they're Christians, but only occasionally go to church. And then there are committed evangelical men who are deeply committed to Christ. And here's what she found about the studies of men when you don't just lump together evangelical Christians, but you account for which ones are serious, which ones aren't. She said this, committed evangelical men were across the board in our culture, the most loving to their wives, the most engaged with their children, the least likely to divorce, had the lowest rates of domestic abuse and violence. Do you know which group in our culture tested the lowest, even lower than secular men? It's nominal Christian men. They fit the negative stereotypes of Christians. They spend less time with their kids. Their wives report lower levels of happiness. They are the most likely, more likely than even non-Christians to divorce their wives. And consider domestic violence. While committed evangelical couples reported the lowest rate of violence among any group, nominal Christians reported the highest of any group. Brad Wilcox said, the most violent husbands in America are nominal evangelical Protestants who attend church infrequently or not at all. This would not surprise James. In fact, I think James would say this to us today. One reason why you have so many nominal Christians in your culture is because you have not pressed this category of two kinds of faith. You've let people think that if they believe the facts about Jesus, then they are saved. They just need to now, you know, at some point, start following him as Lord, actually submit to him as the ruler of their life, and so forth. James would say, but that's not even real Christianity. So these two categories are important for understanding even what's going on with the reputation of Christians in America. Fourth, this helps us understand how to live out our faith. So if you want a real living faith, this is how you get it. You don't just agree with facts about Jesus. You trust him personally. And Jesus loves to give people who have dead faith real faith. He loves to save nominal Christians from their Christianity by bringing them true saving faith. So if this is you, come to Jesus with a sincere trust in him. This is not about you now saying, I've got to get busy with works. This is about you getting real faith, actually trusting him. Receive forgiveness of sins. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive a new heart. Follow him as your Lord and Savior and friend. And for those of you with a living faith, this is the kind of faith that brings change. We don't just try to change ourselves now. We keep trusting and loving Jesus, and that trust and love, receiving his love, is what changes us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this clarity in your word and how you help us to understand ourselves. And so we pray that you would fill us with this kind of living, active, working faith that does good. We pray for anyone here who does not have this, that you would grant it by the Spirit's power. We pray that you'd also fill us with compassion for those who think that they're Christians and think they know you, but you do not know them in a saving way. We pray that you'd fill us with compassion and you would help us as believers recognize that so many of these other people around us who are professing faith in Jesus are actually our mission field and need to hear 
the gospel for the first time, truly, and receive it. So we pray that you would grant that. We thank you so much for your kindness to us. In Jesus' name, amen.